Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to today's Medical Center Hour, a program titled Early Warnings, Tuberculosis, Drug Resistance, and HIV AIDS. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities here at the UVA School of Medicine. And we're happy to bring you these weekly programs on subjects of uh, current interest. A month ago, in January 2018, the New England Journal of Medicine published an editorial, A Neglected Epidemic, reminding us of the substantial health and health care burden that tuberculosis continues to be globally in the 21st century. If Ebola virus disease commanded worldwide attention a couple of years ago, with fewer than 30,000 cases and fewer than 12,000 deaths in West Africa, and a handful of cases elsewhere, what are we to make of an infectious disease that across the world infects more than 10 million people and causes 1.7 million deaths every year? This is TB, which surged in the 19th century with urbanization, poverty, and overcrowding, seemed to subside, at least in the developed world, with antibiotic regimens in the late 20th century, but has since resurged and demonstrated stubborn staying power, whether through antibiotic resistance, joining forces with the HIV AIDS epidemic, or explosive growth of impoverished urban enclaves worldwide. TB is both a health challenge and a health system challenge, offering, affecting individuals and communities, and often, especially in the developing world, defying our conventional means of combating and curing infectious disease, a timely topic. Even as this Medical Center Hour is one of our History of the Health Sciences lectures undertaken in partnership with historical collections in the Health Sciences Library, this is also a program with remarkable currency, as the recent New England Journal piece demonstrates. Historical investigation can be one of the best ways to get a handle on a problem, to gain a sense of how the problem has arisen, why and how it has persisted, how it's changed, and what now we might do to address it with the best likelihood of success. And so we welcome today historian Christian McMillan of UVA's own Corcoran Department of History, a historian with keen interest in global health and pandemic disease, Professor McMillan has written a superb book on tuberculosis, Discovering Tuberculosis, published in 2015. There, he examines TB through the 20th century and documents the nature of and forces responsible for the disease's resurgence in recent years. We also welcome, on my far right from the School of Nursing, Professor Mary Gibson, Associate Director of the Nursing School's Buring Center for Nursing Historical Inquiry. Together, Professors McMillan and Gibson offer perspectives on TB and the threats it has posed and the challenges it continues to represent. So welcome to both of you, and we'll start with Christian McMillan. Uh, thank you very much, Marcia. Thanks for inviting me, and, and thank you for coming this afternoon. As Marcia said, I'm a historian. I teach here at the University of Virginia, and I'm going to talk for a little bit about the emergence of drug-resistant tuberculosis and then the early years of the HIV-AIDS pandemic uh, and how that coincided with an uncontrolled tuberculosis epidemic. I mean, it's really my view that there's been a, a, an explosion of TB since HIV, but TB, but HIV had actually not gone anywhere when HIV, uh, when HIV appeared. Um, most of what I'm going to talk about, really all I'm going to talk about, is drawn, as Marcia suggested from this book, Discovering Tuberculosis, which also looks at American Indians uh, and East Africans and South Africans in the decades before World War II, uh, and looks at the intersection of race and medicine, and then in the post-war period at the BCG vaccination and how it was rolled out across the planet, then antibiotics, and into the HIV-AIDS pandemic. So a few years ago, in a, in a paper provocatively titled Apocalypse or Redemption, responding to extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis, several well-known TB experts reflected on the problem of controlling the disease. They wrote, quote, drug-resistant TB is evidence of a new form of regression. We have taken the curable and made it nearly incurable. If we cannot manage a disease as well-known as tuberculosis, we have little justification to be the stewards of the significant amount of resources given to healthcare globally. 
I read this somewhere in the midst of, of, of kind of formulating this project and doing research, and as I read it and thought back on it, it always became a way for me to explain to myself anyway what I thought I was doing. I thought I could at least try as a historian and explain uh, and answer their question, why have we taken the curable and made it nearly incurable? Whether I've succeeded or not, of course, is, is, is a different matter. So I could, though the story could start in many, many different places, I'm going to start in East Africa, just after the end of World War II. Like many doctors at the time, Arthur Williams, who was a British physician working in Uganda, was frustrated with the little he could do for his TB patients. He noted just after the end of the war, quote, until a specific bactericidal agent, which is both inexpensive and easily administered, is added to our armamentarium, some progress and even a rest of the disease may be achieved by ensuring proper rest and appropriate diet. That was basically the state of his art. Williams, who would go on to become a pioneer in the treatment and control of tuberculosis in East Africa, continued, writing that, quote, no very encouraging reports have appeared on the synthetic preparations so far tried out. This is 1945. But if and when chemotherapy for TB became a reality, he went on, it would, quote, revolutionize not only the treatment of TB, but the whole social and public health problem of tuberculosis. With the discovery of antibiotics, the revolution that Williams imagined that he hoped for came to pass less than a decade later. But it was a revolution the promises of which went unfulfilled, woefully unfulfilled. Excitement over the new drugs uh, had quickly turned into worry, and the hard labor of making them work in the real world began, as did the path very, very early on in the control of tuberculosis with antibiotics of making the curable incurable. So from the 1950s through the 1970s and really into the 19, early 1980s, uh, oh, I have this upside down, Kenya was the site of some of the most important TB research ever undertaken, before or since. Study after study after study came out on Kenya. Both the British Medical Research Council and the World Health Organization launched long-running research projects in, in Kenya to study antibiotics, the mass application of the BCG vaccine, isonized and prophylaxis, and many more. These are just random titles. They're, they're, they're not necessarily correlated uh, to anything specific I'm going to say. But study after study, it was one of the most researched places on the planet, all the way up through the end of the 1970s. Much of what I'm talking about today, too, is drawn from the British National Archives, the Art National Archives of Kenya, WHO, several archives in other parts of the world, um, from files like this uh, in, the, in the National Archives of the UK. For nearly two decades, Kenya and, and other places in East Africa was the scene of an intense effort to understand and control tuberculosis. So I knew that looking at Kenya was going to be critical to this project I was formulating on the history of TB control. But I didn't know quite what the angle was going to be. And then at some point, I came across two, these are just some of the studies WHO was working on. Uh, at some point, I came across two documents that really piqued my interest. They were written nearly a decade apart. The first one in 1952, and the second in 1961. And they both concerned drug-resistant tuberculosis. The first one is over there on the left from the National Archives of Kenya. All this was originally in paper, and I've since, uh, over the years, digitized it. Neither document was particularly optimistic. In the first, a rural doctor, fearing the development of resistance, the eventual development of resistance, refused to use isoniazid a new antibiotic then just on the market and hailed by many, rightly, as a wonder drug. Without a guaranteed adequate supply and some method to ensure patients would complete their course of treatment, this doctor imagined a future, a future he said, he quoted, he thought was, quote, awful to consider, filled with rampant drug resistance, and thus he refused to use the drug. In the second, only nine years later, in 1961, Kenya's director of TV services, uh, warn the government that drug-resistant TB might now be out of control. He wrote, it does not appear to be realized that anti-tuberculosis work with modern drugs necessitates a certain minimum standard of efficiency, below which, there becomes, which they become not a potential hazard, but a definite public health menace, raising indeed the question of ethics in their continued use. You are at that stage now in many parts of Kenya, if indeed you have not already passed it in some. And so I wonder, reading this, 
from between 1952 and 1961, how could it have been that Kenya went in such a short time from being a place with having no antibiotics at all to potentially facing an out-of-control, drug-resistant tuberculosis pro problem by 1961. So one of the points of, uh, that will be abundantly clear, I think, either now or by the end, is that drug-resistant TB is by no means a new problem or one that's only emerged in the last 20 years or so. It's been a problem in the developing world since the very beginning. How is this so, especially at a time when Kenya was under the constant scrutiny of the Medical Research Council and the World Health Organization? So little that happened in the developing world in the decades before World War II could have led one to predict that in the early 1950s, the recently formed World Health Organization in this press release would make TB the target of what it called, quote, the largest mass action the world has ever known against one single disease. Mass TB control, however, was rolled out very, very quickly into parts of the world where little was still known about the disease, and in many places where almost nothing was known. TB control on such a scale was so new and so novel and rolled out so quickly that the WHO and UNICEF, who the WHO often partnered with, dreamt up an imaginary country and called it hypothesia and designed mock plans for a mass vaccination campaign in this non-existent South Asian country. In 1953, the doctor who did the first survey of Africa and tuberculosis, first uh, uh, survey of TB in Africa for the WHO, wondered in amazement at, quote, how much the organization and the world in general would profit scientifically and practically from such work in the terra incognita of Africa. These are just WHO, some promo promotional photographs and some um, uh, just snapshots from the BCG vaccination campaign, which I won't really be talking about much today. Thus, the WHO and UNICEF launched what was become the largest medical intervention in world history, the mass BCG vaccination campaign, had the, most, the widest reach of any intervention campaign. And the Medical Research Council and the WHO set out to do pioneering antibiotic research in what they all recognized as hypothesia and terra incognita. But developing countries' resources, of course, were limited, and so too was their local expertise. And so for these reasons, at the same time, the WHO saw fit to devise what they call, quote, simplified, inexpensive, cruder techniques, equipment and institutions for tuberculosis control, which will be more suitable for the actual conditions encountered. Thus, ambition was already tempered. While realizing, quote, that such methods will be less sensitive than those used elsewhere, they will be realistic and thus far, thus far more effective. For though it will be within the economic and technical possibilities of these countries, and can be extended for large-scale, countrywide mass tuberculosis control work. And what I think, what I'll hope to show, and what the book I think does show, is how naive, how almost willfully naive this viewpoint was. The 1950s and the 1960s, and really into the 70s, the first half of the 70s, were an extraordinary time in TB treatment, a time really like no other. But it was, it was a bipolar time in the world of infectious disease control generally and in TB really specifically. It was full of lofty, lofty highs and, and really deep, deep lows. In public pronouncements and in, in the mainstream press, the 1950s, in the 50s and 60s, there was a, a buzz in the air, no pun intended because of the mosquitoes, uh, about things like disease eradication. Uh, the malaria eradication was in full swing. Uh, by the end of the 1950s and throughout the 1960s. Tremendous excitement over TB's new miracle worker, isoniazid, was abundant in the early 1950s. Uh, the, the coverage of its Lazarus-like effect on tuberculosis patients was featured in publications like Time and the New York Times. And the WHO, again, uh, uh, did a series of promotional photographs showing the drugs themselves, it's thiazina, uh, and then isoniazid, distributing isoniazid to people who were uh, uh, previously unable to access it. This was the climate, the early 1960s, in which infectious disease specialist Aidan Coburn claimed in, 19, in 6, 1961 in Science that, quote, we can look forward with confidence to a considerable degree of freedom from infectious diseases at a time not too distant in the future. And he went on to write this book about it. Some believe that medical technology would promote the leap from primitive society to modern civilization. More WHO 
promotional photographs, people in a, a village in West Africa reading the, w, the latest WHO newsletter, and a Western doctor meeting monks in Cambodia. Modern medicine being brought to the primitive world. Walsh McDermott, who was a prominent TV expert and one of the pioneers in the development of isoniazid, argued that programs led by outsiders would and could fundamentally change the way people interacted with medicine. In a lecture given at the National Institutes of Health in 1963, McDermott declared that biomedical research and interventions were crucial to what he called plan modernization. Purposeful modernization, he went on to say, was, quote, the major social movement of our times. And antibiotics were in the forefront of that modernization effort. Indeed, according to McDermott, because of antibiotics, the control of TB, in fact, quote, is one of the few instances to date in which a major disease can be decisively altered without having to wait improvement in the social infrastructure. A painfully naive, it would turn out, uh, to be sentiment. In 1962, Fred Soper, who was famous for his, uh, his efforts to eradicate malaria, declared that TB, too, could be wiped off the face of the earth. When people finally accepted that TB was, quote, no longer a social and economic, but rather a public health and medical administrative problem, Soper wrote, it could be done away with. And these are not two cranks coming in from the outside world of TB control. Walsh McDermott, Fred Soper, and others are the front and center of infectious disease control in the 1960s. But on the ground and in the field, rather than be dazzled by the promise of new drugs, many TB workers were at best cautiously optimistic. And more often they appear in the face of drug resistance, escalating rates of TB, and cost to be frustrated with the lost promise of medical technology. Uh, the far more realistic uh, paper on what it would take to actually eradicate tuberculosis in the early 1960s. Out of the spotlight, in correspondence, memos, meeting minutes, quarterly reports, and all the kinds of archival material that historians uh, like to work with, indeed need to work with, it's clear that most, in fact, were worried Field workers were frustrated repeatedly with planners. One UNICEF field agent said in 1950, referring to a project from the Philippines, that, quote, this whole project looks like a marijuana fantasy, end quote, <laughs> of unrealistic expectations and poor planning. In 1957, WHO policy on mono drug therapy, the WHO at that point in, into the 60s was advocating the use of isoniazid alone because it was an inexpensive way to deal with tuberculosis. This policy met with firm resistance in British Somaliland, as one example, when the director of medical services refused to use the drug alone, telling the WHO that if forced to do so, the WHO would no longer be allowed to work in the country. And despite the breakthroughs, despite the urgency most felt regarding TB, research was carried out, one British doctor noted, in a hand-to-mouth existence. Guaranteed funding did not exist, and by the early 60s, the, the Medical Research Council lamented that, quote, it was clear that the research being carried out in East Africa is barely viable. At the same time, research sponsored by the WHO was in trouble, too. Donor nations already, by the early 60s, were growing weary of spending money on TB research and were beginning to place restrictions on their donations. And in Kenya, where Africa's most robust TB control program was running at full speed, the director of TB programs mournfully reported that after five years of hard work, quote, it cannot be claim, com, claimed with any degree of confidence that the pro problem shows any signs of diminishing. The European director of UNICEF said it well when he declared in 1962 that establishing, quote, adequate tuberculosis control programs in developing countries is no more than a dream, since even the most rudimentary organization for public health protection is lacking, and that tuberculosis control in these countries can only be considered within the framework of more broadly based and strengthened public health services. So it turned out that changing the social infrastructure was critical. By the late 1960s, another doctor at the MRC found TB research in East Africa to be in near chaos. But should more have been, no more, rather, have been expected when moving so rapidly into hypothesia and terra incognita. So lacking infrastructure and a standard of care, drug-resistant TB only grew, so that by the late 1950s and the early 1960s, it had become, a, had become serious, not only in Kenya, but elsewhere in Africa and well beyond. 
Report, reports from Ghana, and from, as it was then called, as just two examples, Rwanda, Urundi, revealed appallingly high rates of drug-resistant tuberculosis. 28% and 52% in one survey of patients presenting, were presenting with drug-resistant TB in those countries. And in South Asia, one, uh, South India, rather, one doctor reported that, quote, the number of patients excreting resistant strains presents a formidable problem. Before very long, it may be too late to do anything about it. Arthur Williams, who I mentioned already, wondered if the time had come to stop putting so much effort, in fact, into figuring out how to treat drug-sensitive TB, and instead focus on the, quote, already alarming problems of drug-resistant infection. After all, he went on, quoting, drug resistance, particularly isoniazid resistance, is in the forefront of problems facing those trying to control TB in East Africa. This is from 1962. The way people explained this, for the most part, was that people were disappearing from treatment, lacking adequate staffing, lack, lacking adequate drug supply, uh, and lacking uh, a, a robust public health infrastructure. Patients were lost to treatment all over the continent. Doctors in the field in Kenya and elsewhere have been reporting on the same problem for years. Based on reports he had been getting from clinics, the director of TB services noted that they had lost sight of 25% of patients, uh, resulting in, quote, a steadily increasing number of chronic, untreatable, drug-resistant cases. He worried about what this meant and explained it well. Quote, the real significance of the lost sight of cases is the public health aspect of the matter, and that the secondary cases to which they give rise must necessarily, in large proportion, be infected with tubercle bacilli, which are drug-resistant ab initio. So he's worried about a burgeoning but unseen drug-resistant TB epidemic uh, all over the country. And the problem, as I document in the book, was not limited to Kenya. It was a problem all over the developing world. Anywhere TB drugs have been introduced and there wasn't an adequate infrastructure to, um, to ensure their proper delivery. What makes all of this that much more tragic is that oftentimes these warnings from the field went unheeded. Their worries simply weren't taken seriously. In 1956, Johannes Holm, who ran the WHO's TB unit and the, and the mass BCG vaccination campaign, stunned the gathering of Kenyan doctors when he told them in a visit that the risk of drug-resistant TB was, quote, more theoretical than practical. Four years later, the WHO's expert committee on tuberculosis sort of the final word on tuberculosis policy in the world of international health at the time. Quote, the committee noted that drug resistance, especially isoniazid resistance, has not proved to be the public health problem originally feared. Now, from where such a claim came is a mystery. It would have been impossible to find anyone in Kenya, much less, uh, uh, or, or, and likely the rest of the continent, who would have supported it. What makes the claim especially odd, I mean, aside, of course, from its sheer absurdity, is that the WHO sponsored much of the research that in fact revealed drug resistance in the first place. The warnings from the field were not the only ones. They also came from people with the ear of those making decisions. In the early 1960s, uh, Wallace Fox knew more probably about field research and field conditions than anyone else in the world. By then, he had led ambitious research projects uh, in, in, for the MRC, the Medical Research Council, and the WHO in East Africa, South India, Hong Kong, Great Britain, and he would go on to work in, in several other places. He's most famous, or originally famous, for de demonstrating that domiciliary care, taking care of TB patients at home rather than, a hosp than in the hospital, was an effective way to control tuberculosis. Uh, it's a famous study. Uh, he led the team that did this research and published it in 1959 in the Bulletin of the World Health Organization. He then went on later in his career in the, in the 1970s to pioneer short-course chemotherapy. Uh, there are very few single individuals who have been more instrumental in the control of tuberculosis. This is from 1975, if you can't uh, see that. Fox offered the following sobering observation in a private paper addressed to the MRC's Tropical Medicine Research Board in 1962. Claims for chemotherapy, he said, have often tended to be over-optimistic because they have been based on selected groups of patients with drug-sensitive organisms under special conditions. What he meant, of course, was that research trials were no substitute for reality, but in fact they were often taken as substitutes or stand-ins for reality. 
In developing countries, the ideal condition of the trial were rarely present. Now, this doesn't sound like a revelatory insight, but believe me, at the time it was. What Fox knew prevailed in many places was, quote, a high prevalence of tuberculosis, much initial drug resistance, a population that often fails to take oral medicaments regularly, and in a context of poor general and nutritional conditions, and a minimum of medical and ancillary personnel. In other words, no infrastructure. Effective drugs were well and good, but if the conditions for their application, he and Tone, uh, 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 were absent, he and Tone, they would have no effect at all, or in fact, a negative effect, in that they'd create more drug resistance. Now, Fox continued this critique two years later in another privately uh, circulated paper, this time to the World Health Organization. The striking progress, as he called it, made in the developed world was hardly in evidence in the developing world. Most clinics, he observed, were run haphazardly, with staff make, having no clear direction and just making it up as they went along. Fox told the WHO that, quote, this picture of combined chemotherapy, no chemotherapy, single drug chemotherapy, dictated by the availability of drugs, drug availability was an enormous problem, and the often haphazard use of other measures, such as chemoprophylaxis and mass radiography, underlies the importance of having well-defined priorities and a clear policy for chemotherapy, of which one didn't simply exist. What Fox described was gained from significant field experience, uh, and is a far cry, of course, from, the, from Walsh McDermott's fantasy of changing the face of TB without changing what he called the social infrastructure. As the decade progressed, the problem did not get any better. One example. In the Kiambu district in Kenya in 1968, the district medical officer reported that things were falling apart. Over the previous decade, clinics in Kiambu had registered nearly 6,000 tuberculosis patients and put them on treatment. They lost sight of almost 3,500 of them, all partially treated with antibiotics. And, and much of what I'm, I'm describing is, is gathered, um, you know, whether it's of interest or not, I don't know, but from these kinds of clinical reports from uh, uh, you know, doctors and so forth that write these annual or rather quarterly reports, monthly reports, and, and, and uh, I was able to find all these things in the in National Archives in Kenya in, in Nairobi and, and sort of put this picture together of a collapsing TB infrastructure, or maybe better put a TB infrastructure that was never there to collapse in the first place. Despite the problems associated with TB in the Kiambu district, the WHO chose sites in this district to be the location of the pilot phase of Kenya's national tuberculosis program. One cynic claimed that it was just simply because it was a convenient location nearby Nairobi. Problems plagued this program from the start. Inadequately trained staff, dwindling stocks of crucial supplies, concern over who was in charge, and, and on and on, all ensure that this pilot program was doomed. Frequent staff changes, really abysmal case finding, antiquated treatment, all of this and more was routinely noted in report after report after report. When the pilot program wrapped up in the spring of 1971, the WHO's senior medical officer lamented that, quote, in an understatement, the performance of this test run area has been rather poor. The Kenyan director of TB services noted that the final report on the pilot program made it clear that this model should not be followed anywhere in Kenya. And yet, when the WHO assessed their time in Kenya in 1973, they had this to say. The National Tuberculosis Program, tested in the Kiambu district, was found to be feasible and suited to the health context of Kenya. And it should therefore be expanded to cover the whole country in three to four years time. Two years later, it was official, the pilot program uh, experience convinced the WHO to expand the National Tuberculosis Control Program. That said, perhaps it was enough for Kenya. When the WHO and Kenya amended the agreement regarding the WHO's role in the country, the parties found that despite some of the problems, quote, the program model has proved to be well adapted to the sanitary context of Kenya, or as they said earlier, the health context of Kenya. What precisely was Kenya's sanitary context or its health context? Well, it's, it's not clear, but one can infer that the outcome of the pilot program in this context was the best that anyone could expect, so we might as well push on with it. More than two decades into a period of sustained and robust research and field work, the director of Kenya's Tuberculosis Investigation Center confessed in 1978 
that unfortunately, quote, there is little information available to show whether the situation has been a fairly stable one or whether there is a market tendency towards improvement. Two years later, the Medical Research Council sadly came to a very similar conclusion regarding TB in the developing world as a whole, saying that, quote, there is no evidence that its incidence, TB's incidence, is declining, nor that it will necessarily decline in the near future without the introduction of better methods of control specific to such countries. And then, tragically, came AIDS. The arrival of HIV AIDS, uh, generally speaking, was the end of this age, or if it hadn't already been killed off, the age of hubris. Any bluster about the death of infectious diseases more or less disappeared with the arrival of HIV. Indeed, the discourse changed almost entirely, and the opposite became true. Dire worry set in when HIV made one of the world's oldest and deadliest diseases even worse. 31 years ago, in, in 1987, two researchers wrote that, quote, the combination of both diseases could be at the root of a horrifying hecatomb, with, and that's a sacrifice or, a, or the public slaughter of many victims uh, in the years to come. When a group of HIV and TB experts gathered at the WHO's TB unit and the Global Program on AIDS uh, in 1990 to discuss how preventative antibiotic therapy might alleviate some of the TB burden, they, put the, they, they explained the problem well. Before the HIV epidemic, they wrote, developing countries achieved at best an annual decline of some 3 to 5 percent in tuberculosis. The present increase, therefore, represents a tremendous setback in control efforts. In addition to the direct consequences regarding the caseload, it is very likely that the increased incidence of pulmonary tuberculosis will entail a similar increase in the risk of infection, which in turn will result in an increase in tuberculosis in the entire population. And that is exactly what happened. The WHO representative in Brazzaville in 1992 said that HIV, quote, has led to an increase in tuberculosis, reducing or tending to wipe out any progress made so far. That same year, the global program on AIDS was blunt. Because of HIV in Africa, quote, since 1986, an almost exponential increase in reported tuberculosis cases has occurred. And finally, so serious was the problem that in 1994, the WHO and the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease claimed that, quote, the combined epidemics of HIV and tuberculosis present a public health threat, challenge rather, unlike any other faced this century. Now, reports like this, unfortunately, could go on and on and on, ad infinitum. But the point is clear, I think anyway, that 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, most agreed that HIV was refueling a resurgence in TB and creating a public health menace. But despite this early recognition, really from the very early years of the AIDS pandemic, of the relationship between these two diseases, very little was done during the first three decades of the HIV pandemic to stem the tide of HIV TB. In a 2006 interview, Arata Kochi, who directed the WHO's TB unit in the 1990s, claimed, uh, admitted that, quote, one thing I didn't do well was develop an additional strategy in addition to DOTS for HIV TB. That is my regret. In a major 2007 survey, uh, this one here, uh, of the global TB HIV crisis, Three people long involved in the pandemic, from UNAIDS and WHO, wrote, one might have expected some 23 years after the first reports of HIV-associated tuberculosis that there would be close coordination and policy, uh, policy making on TB HIV matters. But in fact, neither the HIV nor the TB community has responded adequately to the problems. In 2010, so relatively recently, Another well-known group of experts wrote that the global response, quote, to the onslaught of TB HIV, TB HIV, particularly in the killing fields of Eastern and Southern Africa, has been timid, slow, and uncoordinated. And they asked, when will we act? But long before these two critiques, and many, 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 many others like them, appeared, impatience regarding, on, regarding action on TB, uh, TB HIV epidemic had already set in. More than two decades earlier, a group of experts gathered in Geneva at the, world, at, the, at the headquarters of the World Health Organization to try and hammer out a set of guidelines for how national TB programs might operate in the face of HIV. At the end of their report, the authors wrote that, quote, actions recommended in this report should be taken as soon as possible to avoid further lost opportunities and to increase 
uh, increase the possibility that the TB HIV problem will finally be addressed successfully. Finally be addressed successfully. In that was 1989. 30 years earlier, antibiotics and optimism had first made their way into East Africa, India, and other parts of the developing world. An incurable disease had, in fact, become curable. But now, the gains made, however tenuous they were, were on the verge of being erased. This is from uh, 2008 uh, uh, WHO document. And uh, it has become increasingly clear that HIV and tuberculosis co-infection uh, is a major public health threat. Well, if it only was increasingly clear to them by 2008, they had ignored the previous 30 years of extraordinary evidence uh, of the problem. When a group of TB experts, TB and HIV experts, got together in 1990, they could not have been more clear about just how bad things were. Quote, the participants expressed, this is a, a quote from this report, the participants expressed a sense of urgency because of the increasingly disastrous situation with respect to dual infections and a feeling of frustration resulting from difficulties in starting the studies that are needed if disaster is to be avoided. That was 28 years ago. So the problem was not ignored. Many knew what was going on. And for a time, the TB unit and the, the Global Program on AIDS worked on the problem of TB HIV. Major, well-funded research projects were well underway by the late 1980s and early 1990s. Medical journals regularly published on the subject. So how did it come to be that HIV TB was ultimately ignored for so long? To begin with, and there's several ways of answering this, but, but briefly, to begin with, by the time AIDS emerged, TB was no longer, and had not been for quite some time, the urgent matter uh, it once was. By the end of the 1970s, innovation in TB control had more or less stopped uh, with the development of short course chemotherapy. TB was no longer, and had not been for some time, the focus of what the WHO had called in 1953 the largest mass action the world has ever known against a single disease. It had become, in fact, a neglected disease. After several decades of sustained work in TB control, by the middle of the 80s, very few were paying the disease any attention at all. The WHO International Union uh, report noted in 1982 that many of the developed world thought TB was no longer a problem. The WHO had drastically cut its TB budget. In the Brit British Medical Research Council, the leader in TB research in the developing world for decades, shut down its entire TB unit in 1986 when Wallace Fox retired. Carl Stieblow, famous TB researcher of, of the Union, lamented at a meeting in Geneva in October of 1989 that, quote, it is regrettable that in at least the last decade, tuberculosis has been ignored by much of the international health community. This was especially appalling, according to Stieblow, because, quote, the magnitude of the tuberculosis problem in developing countries is staggering. In 1995, yet another group of experts gathered in Geneva and pulled no punches. Quote, consistently, the world community has, even, has failed even to implement those effective and well-tried measures against tuberculosis that have existed for almost 40 years. TB, a neglected disease few cared about, and which some thought was no longer a threat, was, of course, actually on the verge of becoming uncontrollable. And amidst this great concern and facing this daunting challenge, this group gathered in Geneva in 1989 looked hard for a ray of light, a minimal ray of light in the darkness. They hoped that, quote, the association of tuberculosis and HIV infection may increase public awareness of the seriousness of the world tuberculosis problem. If this increased awareness is translated into concern, funding, and action, tuberculosis programs throughout the world will be strengthened. So this is what things had come to. TB had become so neglected, uh, uh, so ignored, that it was hoped that one devastating disease, new disease, AIDS, would in fact bring fresh atten attention to the other. That HIV and AIDS, appear, a a AIDS appeared at a time when TB research and general interest was at its nadir is, of course, a tragic coincidence. And while the WHO officially labeled the TB epidemic a global emergency in 1993, it might have been too late. That same year, the USAID cut its entire overseas TB budget. The national TB programs that were once WHO's great hope for TB control uh, in places like Kenya were in a shambles. Even Tanzania, which was home by then, uh, by the end of the 80s, to Afri one of Africa's most successful TB control programs, and with the continent's most enviable short-course chemotherapy program, 
just rolled out in 1986, was in trouble. By the summer of 1990, the program was on the, ver quote, on the verge of collapse. And this is all the more poignant because Carl Stiebler, who ran this program, and with AIDS just barely registering, claimed to be achieving cure rates up to 90% in his short course chemotherapy program, leading him to predict that, quote, tuberculosis would cease to be a public health problem by the year 2000. Others wondered about the continent as a whole. Was Africa lost? Experts wondered at a WHO meeting in 1990. Was there simply no way of dealing with the TB HIV co-epidemic? They wrote, we are facing one of the greatest public health disasters since the bubonic plague. And finally, for a short time, a response seemed to be in motion at the WHO as they sponsored more than a half dozen research projects on the possibilities of isoniazid prophylaxis therapy, reasoning that it might prolong the life of AIDS patients and reduce the spread of infection. But this commitment was very, very short-lived. Before the results of the prophylaxis studies were, sh were known, a seri another series of studies appeared and made clear that short-course chemotherapy for TB was a cost-effective intervention. The WHO, uh, there's a tremendous amount of evidence for the WHO's robust response to HIV, TB in the late 80s and early 90s that disappeared by the time dots emerged. When the WHO announced dots in 1994, in the framework for effective tuberculosis control, it all but gave up on HIV, TB. These two studies, the seminal studies, showing that chemotherapy for tuberculosis was one of the most cost-effective public health interventions uh, known, was embraced in 1993 by the World Bank in investing in health, and became global policy on tuberculosis control. Once DOTS was firmly in place, the framework claimed that, quote, systems to monitor HIV seroprevalence and drug resistance in TB should be added. They never were. According to one official at the Centers for Disease Control, the DOTS policy, quote, obstinately neglected MDR-TB. And as I noted earlier, Arata Kochi said in 2006 that one thing I didn't do well is develop an additional strategy in addition to DOTS for HIV-TB. That is my regret. At a time of considerable austerity in global health funding, choosing the most cost-effective solution to a problem rather than several possible solutions was deemed necessary. And so it was that in the mid-1990s that by choosing DOTS, which is directly observed therapy short course, the global health leadership chose to ignore HIV TB. That decision appeared to be short-sighted as research appeared throughout the 90s and into the early 2000s, documenting the insufficiency of DOTS when looked at in the light of HIV TB. But I am moving dangerously close for a historian uh, to the present and dangerously close into material uh, that I have really no business critiquing. Um, and so I'll stop there. But before, before I do, I just want to say, I want to say that I would very much welcome comments regarding the lack, the value or lack thereof of a historical sp perspective on contemporary problems. Historians, of course, are already convinced that a historical perspective is critical. That's obviously what we do for a living. But it's always very interesting, of course, to learn from others why it may or may not be valuable in thinking again about serious contemporary problems. Thank you. Well, that was a fascinating walk through the book. Um, I'm going to actually uh, give you a little bit of a different perspective from another part, other parts of the book, um, and I just I want to recommend it highly. Um, the book definitely incorporates voluminous research. I mean, you can see with epidemiology, you know, medical and global health sources across continents, um, and these global eradication strategies over time. Um, it's truly a remarkable work, and I think anybody interested in global health policy, medical history, um, those working in global health or in uh, in those in you know in changing concepts of disease, all of these people really might benefit from reading this book. It reiterated to me as a student of the early 20th century the long-standing assertions 
of racial and impoverished populations enhance susceptibility to disease, which we didn't really talk much about today, but it's very clear in the book, and a frequent assert, which became a frequent assertion throughout the 20th century. And as health disparities persist in our own country and, local, and globally, the lessons learned from strategies that did achieve success and didn't achieve success or failed can provide guideposts for our upstream planning in the future. For me, discovering tuberculosis about several key points about global approaches to TB, and I'm only going to address two, and they're actually, you know, very straightforward. Um, first, the tactics to that were employed to combat TB tended to apply a one-size-fits-all approach. While research had advanced radically since the beginning of the these anti-TB efforts to include randomized controlled trials and more sophisticated epidemiological understanding, the World Health Organization and colonial governments persistently, um, through much of the 20th century, applied uniform strategies to combat the disease with little regard for local cultural or health practices. Um, not just with BCG, but with directly observed therapy, um, the deadly combination of TB and HIV, and the emergence and treatment of multi-drug resistant TB. It was the unidimensional efforts that came at a time when the urgency of the situation and the increasing mortality demanded something be done. And I think that is key. They wanted to do something. As one British TB authority suggested referring to BCG, which is quote, who's quoted in the book, Quote, it appeared to offer a simple method of prevention, faute de mieux, um, unquote, which means for lack of a better alternative. Um, to put that in perspective, the controversial BCG vaccine uh, to date has reached 4.5 billion people, many of whom um, got it during that mass vaccination campaign throughout the, the um, second half of the 20th century. These anti-TB approaches advanced in the face of other apparent limitations, which leads to my second take-home point. Poor economic conditions in the country of treatment and the lack of health infrastructure provided clear evidence that the spread of the disease had as much to do with what we now refer to as the social determinants of health as it did with the biomedical solution to the disease itself. <clears throat> Granted, there are no quick fixes. This is not an easy problem. Um, and now the UN and World Health Organization have millennial goals that address these social determinants of health. The goals aim to combat poverty, hunger, disease, illiteracy, environmental degradation, and discrimination against women. And all of these goals um, can be closely linked to the spread of not just TB, but all infectious diseases and endemic diseases, and you know, really can influence the overall health of, in diverse parts of the world. But the progress is slow. And, it, and in, Granted, it so often depends on governments and their capabilities or inclination to promote the economic development of their own countries, um, the health infrastructure, and the education of all of their citizens. As with any good historical work, uh, Christian's book leaves us with ongoing questions beyond only the biomedical. What are the best TB eradication practices that can cross cultural and geographic boundaries? How can nuanced strategies be rolled out on a multicultural landscape via systems of care that are at various levels of development, even now? How can countries successfully unite upstream um, to combat this ancient killer? And how will we pay for it? History can inform future planning for successful health policy. The TV story told here involves vulnerable populations, Medical, I mean, it's like a, it's like a novel. Um, medical hubris, earnest and committed researchers, grassroots health workers, um, cost accounting and economic constraints, massive global and colonial public health efforts, and failed well-meaning strategies. We can continue to ask, why can't we control TB? The recent Moscow Declaration of November 2017 renewed the long-standing global effort of the past century to end TB by 2030 and it's widely supported. We can only hope that the lessons of the past will inform the strategies um, employed in these newest efforts. Then as now, a primary issue in the discussion of global rates of tuberculosis is offsetting the social and economic conditions that foster the spread of TB. Thank you both, and we have, um,
should be on. Um, we have some time for your questions and comments. Um, I think a lot of questions were raised at the end of Mary's comments, which are which are helpful and which point out um, again that this is a, a problem that biomedicine has been looking at, but it's also a problem of much larger social and cultural proportions. Um, so uh, I will bring a mic to you, or John will bring a mic to you. Um, if, when you have the mic, please identify yourself and uh, ask your question or make your comment. So the floor is now open. Or should it feel yeah. Sure. Uh, <coughs> fill in a moment here uh, uh, as people think of their very provocative questions, I'm sure. I'm Dick Grant, uh, Center for Global Health and Infectious Diseases. And uh, Mary and Christian, thank you immensely for a terribly more important message, I believe, than we have begun to appreciate. Uh, the uh, idea of the best of our biomedical progress, achieving the success of making the curable incurable is really troubling. And we need you historians to straighten us out and to step into the present. I'm sorry, Christian, you, we really <laughs> desperately need that. Well, 2006 is pretty close. Uh, <laughs> With a little luck, you may go past that. And the, the profound, sobering point about our interdependence, I think, is, is just uh, more poignantly brought out by your TV story than perhaps almost any other. Um, you didn't mention uh, the possible link as we bridge social and biomedical, each of which is, I hope we can begin to learn, totally interdependent upon the other, each in both directions. Yeah. I would argue we desperately need both, and we need both to pay attention to the other. But can you comment on, uh, uh, say, Paul Farmer, for example, has, by paying attention to the one person, who is suffering is perhaps giving us some clues that will benefit all of society. Any comments on that? On, uh, well, so briefly on the, on the comment about coming up to the, the present, um, I will say that the, uh, the end of the, the last bit of the two chapters of the book really focus on ice and eyes and prophylaxis therapy, uh, and which I <laughs> have uh, limited expertise in. Uh, but I, I I bring it up to the, what the present was when the book was published, and then I was waiting for these studies to come out of the mines in South Africa to show whether or not it had an effect at a population level, as it had been argued for, for many, many decades. Um, but it was a, a, quite uncomfortable uh, critiquing what was going on in the present from the perspective of a historian uh, critiquing biomedical experts. Um, who are still alive and well. Most of the people I talk about have been dead for a long time, so they can't get mad at me. But, um, <laughs> The, uh, as far as Paul Farmer's work is concerned, I mean, I, it, I think, I'm not sure we, what more I can say about it other than to say, I think you're right, that I mean, the model that he's uh, pioneered with a lots and lots and lots of help, and you know, there are models of what he did that one can find even in this book that I suggest, especially from Tanganyika, as it used to be called, that we're working in the 50s and 60s. Um, but you know the argument has always been, and hopefully won't always be, that uh, it's too expensive. Uh, but until, as I've said in the talk several times, investment really goes into public health infrastructure, um, I don't think it'll probably ever change. When, in, in the fall, uh, just this past fall, a group of us met um, at, uh, at, at, at Harvard and Paul, gave a, a talk and, and um, it was a weekend spent with a, a relatively small group of us about the, um, the rate of success for, you know, that we heard a lot about how in the, in the press about how Ebola had this fatality rate of something like 60 to 
Um, but the fatality rate of those who were infected with, with uh, Ebola that were uh, not African, that were white, you know, healthcare workers for the most part was zero. Uh, suggesting that, again, you know, the argument being that, that, that with, with adequate treatment and access to treatment and so forth, uh, much of this, I mean, this, I'm not telling anybody anything they don't know, but I mean, I think that has to be the message that's hammered home over and over and over again, if that's helpful. Yeah, I had actually considered bringing up Paul Farmer in my comments, but I decided I didn't have much time. <laughs> Uh, hello, uh, my name is Genesis Hines. I'm a fourth year med student here, and I actually just got back from an international elective in Tanzania. Uh, and I think one of the things that I was thinking about as you were speaking is the fact that um, Kenya itself had so much MDR TB at a very early stage, but was also a hub for research, TB research. Um, and I'm just curious how the incidence of MDR TB uh, is different in countries like Tanzania that neighbor Kenya. Um, and probably had very similar incidences of TB, but weren't a hub for research. Mm -hmm. um, and if there's any data that looks at um, how much the incidence of MDR TB can be attributed to research itself, iatrogenic mm -hmm. causes, as opposed to just the introduction of uh, antibiotics um, in places like Kenya. I'm just curious. Uh, yeah, I, I, historically, meaning in the period that I'm, I'm talking about, um, it's an interesting point because it's it's other than the um, the pub there is a lot, a lot of um, not quite anecdotal evidence from the 50s 60s and 70s on drug resistance and I cited some of it in um, in the talk but then there's a lot more in the in the book but one of the major problems of really being able to determine how much drug resistance there really was uh, was that there were so few sites of research actually going on in places like East Africa. Kenya was really, as you said, the epicenter of it. Um, and it, you know, it spread out a little bit into Uganda and into Tanzania. But Kenya was at the epicenter of it, so the best data was coming from Kenya. Um, and then one could say the same thing about South India, particularly Madras, now Chennai, and then Hong Kong, and a couple of places like that where the MRC was doing work. And so, for example, when the WHO tried to look at the problem of drug resistance globally um, in, uh, in the mid to late 1960s and gather data on it, uh, the guy by then who was directing the, um, uh, the TB unit, Hopton Mahler, who went on to be the director general, uh, he wrote to uh, district medical officers and so forth all around the colonial and post-colonial world asking for this kind of data to try and see was what by then they were acknowledging was happening in places like Kenya and South India happening elsewhere. And the almost universal response he got from um, people on the ground and in the field, I don't know. You know, we have no way of knowing because we lose sight of so many patients and we have no capacity to track them down. Um, we have no capacity to test for drug-resistant tuberculosis, except in these few places where that were the centers of TBU research. And I would, to the question of whether or not research itself, the process or the location of, might promote drug resistance, I would say only, maybe, and this is pure speculation, only insofar as those are the places where the drugs are more available. But all over East Africa and into West Africa, by this period, there was a huge black market already for isoniazid and POS and other TB drugs. So that also explains part of the explosion of drug resistant TB that no one had adequate statistics on. So hopefully that answers your question. We have time for one more question. Well, I, I guess I, as a historian myself, I would really like to understand how you got interested in this topic in the first place. <laughs> it's pr it's quite a, a you know monumental project. Mm. Um, so I, I before this book, uh, I, had writ I and still am. I still teach American Indian history, and uh, the what I uh, so I, I've always been a historian of the ninth, late nineteenth and through the twentieth century. And, uh, you know, in American Indian history, it doesn't take more than a minute of thinking about it or reading about it to realize that disease is a big deal. And, um, and it turns out that TB in the 20th century had become the number one killer of American Indians. Uh, and, and I started to wonder why that was so, and I, you know, long story short, 
I, I realized that BCG was tested on American Indian reservations in the 1930s and 40s, and that's where it was determined to have an 80% efficacy rate in these trials that were run uh, by a man named Joseph Aronson. And then that number, that efficacy rate, uh, was used as the argument for launching it across the world. And so my interest in American Indian and TB kind of blossomed out into what became this book. And Dick gave me lots of money early in my research to send me <laughs> around the world to gather. I did not Dick personally, but the Center for Global Health. <laughs> well, thank you both for fascinating presentations and, and ones that I think have alerted us um, appropriately to a problem that is continuing and, and that needs, certainly needs addressing. Um, please join us next week, uh, the um, 28th of February. We have historian James Del Borgo here from Rutgers University. He's going to be talking about slavery, empire, and the cabinet of curiosities, Hans Sloan and the origins of the British Museum. So we will see you here uh, next Wednesday. Again, please join me in thanking uh, Christian McMillan and Mary Gibson.